all for that wonderful introduction. I'm so excited with all of my feedback <laughs> to be able to be here today and thank you for sticking around uh, for the last session of the, of the day prior to Varmus's talk this afternoon. I'm, I'm, here's a, I am a consultant for Genome Oncology um, as far as my disclosure. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is the growing use of genomics in cancer. Um, you in this audience are highly aware of that, um, but give you a little bit of a perspective from a treating oncologist, um, which is a rare opportunity for me to be able to speak to this group today. I want to talk then about my cancer genome and how we are developing our content for that resource and how we're disseminating it. And finally, some of the challenges and future directions that we have ahead. So as all of you know, biomarkers are used for decision support across the continuum of cancer care, really even starting before diagnosis at the point of risk stratification and even for screening, all the way to diagnosis, treatment selection, treatment plan management, and treatment response assessment. And we're all now getting to be much more familiar with these labels that we're putting on the biomarkers when they're used in different types of treatment contexts. But the challenge for providers, as well as for those who are interpreting the results, includes different types of decisions that we need to support, including which tests to order in the first place, which ones are going to be clinically relevant to the patient I'm seeing right now, how do you interpret and report those results, and how do I apply them as a provider to the patient's care. And when you think about decision support, you need to consider uh, several things, including when to deliver that decision support, so the timing of it, whom to deliver it to, and how, so the mode of the decision support. And um, we are learning a great deal now, particularly as we focus on this predictive biomarker space, which I'm going to spend the most of my time talking about. So in the not too recent past, we would be treating patients with solid tumors, malignancies, um, all the same way. If you had non-small cell lung cancer, everybody got the same treatment. And we had no idea how to differentiate between one group versus the other. And when we did that, we only had about a third of the patients responding to treatment. So the responders are the one in blue, and those not responding are those in orange. So this was the sad state of affairs just as recently as 2002. Uh, the seminal paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which showed comparing four platinum-containing chemotherapy protocols all head-to-head -head and showed that there was no improvement between any of them. So this is a survival plot. There's no, there's no separation between any of these curves. And that was, just in, that was just 12 years ago. This was the standard of care for treatment of lung cancer, survival rates of eight months. Well, everything started to change in 2009, especially for the treatment of lung cancer, when we began to see EGFR-mutated lung cancer in these two seminal trials, um, starting with the IPASS study, showed that if you had an EGFR-mutated patient and you gave them a targeted therapy compared to platinum-containing chemotherapy, that you finally were starting to get some separation between these two curves. And we were finally beginning to see some survival advantage. By now, instead of treating an unselected population all the same way, identifying those patients who have a particular biomarker that now predicts their response to therapy and inform our selection of treatment for that patient. So now instead of treating everybody in this population the exact same way, we now subset this population and we treat these group of patients completely separately. And instead of getting response rates of 30 percent, we're now getting response rates upwards of 80 percent. And so now we really begin to move the bar on how these patients are responding to treatment. So we call those patients who are having an upfront response to treatment as having primary sensitivity. And unfortunately, even despite the presence of a predictive biomarker, there are still going to be some patients who don't respond to the treatment we give them. And we call those patients as having primary resistance. Now we're finally beginning to understand that it's not just one biomarker. Tumors are complex. And there's multiple different ways in which a tumor can have co-occurring alterations that allow it to be resistant even to these targeted agents where one mutation might suggest that there would be a sensitivity. 
And unfortunately, at least in the metastatic setting, even though these patients initially responded, these tumors do develop additional mutations and they, their, the disease will ultimately progress and we're finding now um, acquired resistance mutations of the tumor adapting to the targeted therapy. And as we're beginning to understand that, there's a whole biological diversity of mechanisms whereby tumors can evade the primary target. And so not only are, is in this next generation of therapeutics for oncology, are we trying to address these, these and identify these patients who may have primary sensitivity and overcome that primary sensitivity. We're also developing therapies to help um, delay this acquired resistance by doing multiple pathways simultaneously. So it's a very exciting time in the treatment of cancer patients. Much of this has been enabled by our, everyone's favorite graph on the falling cost of the genome. And, and it's truly remarkable, especially in the cancer space, we now, even if we're doing small panels, um, for, for several thousand dollars or less, we are able to characterize the mutational status of the tumors and use it for some cancers as part of standard of care. But unfortunately, as we've continued to increase the depth of our coverage of these genes, more and more genes going from testing just back in 2009, uh, a single mutation in a single gene, then to be doing hotspot panels in 2010 and 2011, to now doing next-gen sequencing, the amount of data that is hitting a clinician is absolutely overwhelming. So we've really reversed the flow of information from data that was collected only in the context of research studies and often never even, um, even got exposed to the treating provider and was only done in a research setting for correlative studies to now actually getting this data at the point of care and trying to be able to make sense of it. And it is very overwhelming um, as an oncologist to try to make sense of, you know, uh, often, you know, anywhere between three and 12 variants that we'll find on a next-gen sequencing panel. And so part of what, and, and on top of that, um, part of why it's overwhelming is because the levels of evidence are highly variable for the genes on these larger panels. So everyone likes to use the word actionable, and I've had my hand slapped enough to know that we should probably stop using that term. And so I'm trying to refine my vocabulary as I move forward with this. But really, what we're talking about is evidence that moves from a preclinical um, environment to one of clinical validity and clinical utility. This audience, I'm sure, talks about analytic validity all the time. Um, clinical validity is actually um, in the sense that it can separate one population into two or more groups that have distinctly different outcomes. But just because the two groups have a distinctly different outcome doesn't mean that I'm necessarily going to apply that to my clinical decision making yet. And that's really where clinical utility comes in. It's where two populations can be distinguished from one another in such a way that I can uh, make a difference in my clinical decision. And there's all sorts of evidence out there today on how to apply. So in the preclinical pre setting, there's cell lines and animal models. Um, on the clinical validity space, we have case reports, retrospective cohort studies, non-randomized prospective studies. And then finally, usually it takes a randomized prospective study to finally show clinical utility, and at which point then it gets incorporated into guidelines or in FDA approvals for drug indication. But the unfortunate reality is there is still a huge knowledge gap, even in the space of clinical utility. Um, and, and it's not surprising. The names of these things are not subtle, right? You know, there's no such thing as being EGFR positive anymore. That was a nice thing we, you know, I'm a breast oncologist, ER positive, ooh, that's easy, right? You're either it or not. But in the space of uh, an entire gene analysis, there's going to be some genes that are confer sensitivity to a drug and a whole bunch of others that are going to confer resistance. And uh, there's no way we can all possibly memorize the difference between them, and nor really should we. In addition, this is how we used to report the information in the electronic health record. Gladys is in the room, and she remembers these days of Vanderbilt. Um, and where we used to have these, these word templates that would have a whole bunch of text summarizing the assay and the clinical significance just for one gene and one variant. All of that information just for one. And, and it was scanned into the electronic health record. So 
God, as an informatician, I mean, I cringe. I couldn't even parse it to provide clinical decision support. So we needed to find a new way of reporting first our snapshot panel and now next-gen sequencing data where we're now reporting hundreds of genes at a time. And it really begs the question of whose role is it to curate all this knowledge regarding the clinical significance? And finally, how can we incorporate information on clinical trials because um, there is at least research utility to I, um, matching patients up to clinical trials, um, which for many of the genes that are being tested on these larger panels is really, even the small ones, is really the only um, actionable step to take. And see, I did it, I said action. <laughs> so in order to address some of these challenges, we developed My Cancer Genome, which is a knowledge base that has the mission to curate and disseminate knowledge regarding the clinical significance of genomic alterations in cancer. And I'd like to spend the rest of my time talking how we um, generate that content and how we're disseminating it. So let's start with content generation. My Cancer Genome is a publicly available website. It contains several different parts, and I'll take you through each one. The first is a set of manually curated content. It covers deep information on over 21 different cancers that are listed here um, and 56 cancer-related genes for over 428 disease variant relationships. We also have a clinical trial search that extends this scope to now include um, 40,000 different clinical trials from the national clinical trial registries that we download every week and we use um, informatics methods to identify the gene eligibility criteria for those clinical trials um, for over 135 different cancers and all 500 genes that are on the cancer genome atlas. One of our most popular resources is a cancer drug targets um, list where we have information on over 500 cancer drugs, um, both standard of care and those that are at least in a phase one clinical study. That's our threshold for including a drug. And we go over their targets and their mechanisms of action. Um, so these are some of the classes of drugs. And we're even starting to get some of the immunotherapy um, uh, drugs in there, even though it's not clear what their target is going to be from a biomarker perspective. And finally, we have a direct database, which is a database of rare mutations. And I'll say more about this, but it's basically a published set of case reports of drug response. So how does My Cancer Genome work? You go to the website. You don't need a login. That's what you just want to clarify. It's been one of our mantras from the beginning. Um, you select a disease, you select a gene, and you select one of the variants that we have curated information on. And this takes you to a page that has a very concise summary of the clinical significance of that alteration in that particular cancer. So our goal, our, our main audience that we're, that we're reaching out for is a clinical audience, um, providers, molecular pathologists, pathologists, anyone who would be caring for patients. That said, we do have a lot of patients who come to the website, even though it's not written um, for a lay audience um, and, and, and researchers as well. Um, so the information we contain includes the location of the alteration in the gene, the frequency of the alteration in the disease, and then the response to drugs, which may include sensitivity or resistance. And unlike clinical practice guidelines such as the NPCN or ASCO, My Cancer Genome includes levels of evidence from multiple different resources. Um, and so, so long as the drug is in a phase one study in an in-human trial, we will include the preclinical studies that were the um, inspiration for including that drug. So we will include everything from preclinical studies all the way up to FDA approval journal research. We also summarize the clinical trial evidence. So as the evidence mounts for a particular area, um, research uh, clinicians or researchers can quickly review um, how many patients were in a particular study and their responses um, and their survival. And they can click on the link and get taken directly to PubMed regarding that particular reference to see if, in fact, that study matches the patient that they're seeing in front of them. My Cancer Genome has a number of different types of biomarkers on it that we cover, but our priority had, has always been to really drive treatment decisions. Um, so we, our initial um, priorities were always the sensitivity and resistance biomarkers in the genes that would have um, targeted therapeutics. 
Um, but we have started including um, more and more prognostic and diagnostic biomarkers. And our goal is to make sure that we have all of the highest priority genes um, covered with respect to the, the strength of their evidence and the size of their effects. We don't just include genes, and we started out that way, but it became very clear that we needed to extend our concept of biomarkers um, to not only include the gene variants, such as point mutations, insertions, and deletions, but to also include information that's represented at the exon level. A lot of the old uh, literature, especially in areas like DISH and KRAS, um, for colon cancer talked about exon level reporting. They didn't even report specific variants, so we needed to include those. We also include fusion and rearrangement information, gene amplification, and, and good old protein expression. Now, even though we have all these different types of biomarkers, it's really important to understand that you also have to consider the logical combinations of these variants. So when we first started out, we were doing sort of a gene at a time perspective, but the literature has really grown in our understanding of co-occurring alterations such that we now need to consider um, additional logical um, operators. So here's an example of EGFR um, LA58R mutation, which is a sensitizing mutation to EGFR inhibitors such as allotinib, um, where the response to therapy would be sensitivity in the metastatic setting. If, however, you have a co-occurring alteration with EGFR2790M, you need to be able to represent that this combination of genes actually is associated with acquired resistance. Rarely primary resistance as well, but usually it's in the setting of someone who's previously been treated with allotinib. And it gets even more complicated. <laughs> you also have to be able to represent not relationships. So for the, ta for the situation of cetuximab in colorectal cancer, um, you're, the, you're sensitive to that drug if you do not have one of these exons in KRAS and you don't have one of these in MRAS. So we have to be able to represent the variant logic now um, as co-occurring and or or not uh, relationships. And on top of that, um, we're very keen to explain that the level of evidence may be different for each variant. So even though it's the same drug sensitivity relationship, the FDA only talks about KRAS exon 2 in their label whereas the NCCN talks about exons two, three, and four. So you begin to see that different organizations, and it's highly unlikely that the FDA label is ever going to get updated, right? I mean, it's a huge amount of effort to do that. And so we're gonna have to start looking to other resources to try to understand how the evolving sensitivity and resistance is gonna go. My Cancer Genomes content has grown significantly over the last um, several years. Um, at, a, at a very steady pace. This is just our content on our, on our, um, um, our pan manually curated content. And I, I, I promised Annette Kim I was gonna embarrass her today. There she is. Um, uh, this was, the spike right here was just our MDS content that Annette had helped us put together. Now, it might seem that we don't have that many curated variants um, on our website. We only cover 56 genes in great detail. But when you start to look at the computational combinations of these, it begins to grow very quickly. So 56 genes with over 400 variants now go into over 768 diagnosis variant drug sensitivity relationships, and that's just for less than 40 FDA-approved drugs. When you start to include the experimental therapeutics, that number is growing quite rapidly. My cancer genome um, has a large contributor network that contributes content to our resource. We have a core curation staff and a set of section editors, usually divided by disease area, and then a set of contributing editors along that. The, this is our core team, just four of us at Vanderbilt. Um, my uh, co-editor, Christine Lovely, is a thoracic oncologist. She specializes in ALK. Um, research, um, and then our two uh, permanent staff, um, both who have PhDs. And the, the four of us together coordinate all of our contributors um, and make sure we have a consistent style guide so that we're all using the same language um, and evolving the language, frankly, um, as we learn how best to communicate this information. 
our contributors come from all over the world. So uh, while many of our contributors are coming from Vanderbilt, we have a wide collaboration around the world. If anyone is interested, you know, we recognize that, that this is a, a large community of people who have this knowledge to share. So over 65 different contributors from 21 different institutions in 10 countries on four continents, if you see, if you think that's really what the continent means. Um, so it's been a very exciting effort to bring all these people together to create this wonderful publicly available resource. So that covers what we've been doing on content generation. I'd like to talk in the last uh, half on how we're disseminating our content. So my cancer genome is disseminated in two basic flavors. One is our publicly available resources, and the second is our clinically integrated solution. First, we have our website, mycancergenome.org, and we've developed a mobile app. You'd be surprised. You know, as a practicing oncologist, you know, you're, you're not walking around with your computer all the time, but you are walking around with one of these things, and so we want to make it as easy for people to access the information as possible. And then we have two clinically integrated solutions where we've integrated my cancer genome into Vanderbilt's electronic health records, which I'll show an example of in a moment, and a new integration through a laboratory reporting tool through a collaboration with our vendor partner, Genome Oncology. So as far as the mycancergenome.org website, we have just been overwhelmed by the global impact of this resource. We get over 5,700 site visits per week. And I know, you know, it's not quite Facebook or Google, but we're pretty proud of it. And, and, and we're very proud of um, the fact that this has been so useful, not only to professionals such as yourselves, but also to the patient community. Um, we've also had several recognitions for our website. Um, we were winners of the Health 2.0 Developer Challenge for using public data for cancer prevention and control. Uh, we were one of the um, GE Health Imagination awardees um, back in 2012. And we were also um, named one of the seven top consumer health applications you should know about in 2012 at the Health Data Palooza Challenge. Fun places, I'll tell you. You meet a lot of interesting people. This is a, a screenshot of our mobile app. So basically all the features that we just talked about are inside the mobile app as well. We've had, uh, we launched it in June, and we've had over 1,300 downloads since then. And it's free on you know, the App Store. Unfortunately, we don't have an uh, you know, Android version, so only for those iPhone users. Um, and it was just named one of the best science apps uh, by Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News. All right, so those are our publicly available resources. When we first started My Cancer Genome, our goal was actually to integrate this into Vanderbilt's electronic health records, really just to provide decision support to our own clinicians on what to do with this new data that was coming out at them, even for our smaller um, snapshot panel that we were doing back in 2010. And so this is an example of what our snapshot reporting looks like in Vanderbilt's electronic health record. This is a, a patient panel of a provider in our electronic health record, and um, we're able to show the status of the order so you know, you know, is it ready, has it come back yet, can't tell you how many phone calls this eliminated between the clinic and, and the molecular diagnostics lab because people are really waiting for this result. They're, they're holding back therapy until they know if you've got a BRAF mutation in melanoma. And then each of the genes that were in that panel are shown at the top. There were about 40 different variants in that panel, and it, if there was no variant detected, it was gray, and if there was a variant detected, it showed up as yellow. And then you just clicked on the, on the particular box, and it would show you the specific details. And here, because it was a snapshot panel, we knew exactly which variants we were testing for, and so we could say those were not detected and identify the one that was. And then directly from the electronic health record, the clinician could click on that variant and be taken directly to my cancer genome. And there they would not only see the regular content that we have, but also we um, made it so that they could see the clinical trials that we had available at Vanderbilt, um, in addition to those that were um, available nationwide. So we started out with one variant and one gene, and reporting it in this way, moving now to 40 variants and six genes. How do we go from here to next-gen sequencing? And that is a really big challenge. Now we're going to be testing maybe upwards of hundreds of genes at the same time and, and potentially thousands of variants. 
Um, and not only that, but I want to point out that, that we still have the need to do reporting for multimodal testing. So next gen sequencing is a problem in and of itself, but how do you then integrate that with also your FISH and your, your immunohistochemistry to really begin to have a comprehensive interpretive report that brings everything together? So this is one of the pipelines I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, a conceptualization of what was going to be needed um, in order to take genomic testing um, all the way down to clinical decision making. And here you have the basic steps of you have your assay that, that's done and now you put it in, um, you need to do the task of variant identification and that requires sequence alignment, you need a reference sequence, you may do two new normal comparisons and then you need a molecular annotation of the variants and that requires some form of knowledge bases. Once you have your variants identified, now you need to do the clinical interpretation of those variants. And in order to do that, you need a knowledge base of the, that can help you classify the clinical effect of those variants and help you report on those variants that are likely to be clinically meaningful as well as the variants of unknown significance. And then once this is delivered to the clinician, they can use it to make clinical decisions. So we undertook a pilot to evaluate whether my cancer genome could be used as this knowledge base in the top and the bottom um, for clinically relevant variant interpretation of next-gen sequencing cancer panels. And I'm really excited to say this has been such a productive collaboration with Genome Oncology, who's really had the um, upstream pipeline for the um, entire LIS framework from the time it comes off the sequencer um, to putting it in a report, um, including their LIS, a QC process, that is validating the quality of the runs of the sample, a workbench that they use to actually uh, parse through all the variants that are identified, and finally creation of an interpretive report. And we use my cancer genome at, at many of the steps along this process. I'm not going to talk about it too much today as far as the QC process is concerned. You can talk to the genome oncology team. But one of the things that they developed, which is really neat, is what they're calling a DAM sniffer, which uses my cancer genome to go over the DAM file to make sure that your variant caller didn't miss the most important gene variant, I should say. So it's, it's really important that we don't miss anything in our calls. We wouldn't want to have a negative um, call um, incorrectly because this could impact patient opportunities for targeted therapies. But I will show you for a moment um, what their workbench looks like as far as the decision support for variant analysis. And the way they're using my cancer genome here is um, they divide the variants that you're going to review into those that are actionable for the tumor type, actionable in another tumor type, and those which have no known um, clinical significance. But at least this helps you prioritize your review of those variants so that you're definitely focusing on the ones that are most likely going to have the most clinical utility. And then once um, you've selected those, it uh, uses my cancer genome content to help um, uh, organize the report. So um, this is an example of a generic report. It can be customized. Um, but just to highlight some of the ideas, um, this is a patient who has both an EGFR 2790M mutation as well as an LA58R mutation in EGFR. And so the first top part shows the variants that have potential clinical utility. A second section is showing drug sensitivity with the first section showing um, what we would call level one evidence of the variants in the disease where we actually have um, therapeutic implications there. And here we're actually using one of those complex AND rules to show that, that the combination of these two variants is actually shows to have acquired resistance in this setting. If there are no variants found or there are variants found that are relevant in other diseases, there's also information on those drugs that might be relevant to patients. And finally, information that we pull in from the clinical trials um, that are looking at which trials may be relevant for the patient. And you can customize it to your location. So say I'm in Nashville and I only want to show the trials that are within 50 miles of where I am, um, you can customize which trials end up showing up. On a detailed page, in a subpage, um, it shows information on, um, that's taken directly from my cancer genome content. So information about the gene in general, its location, and then complete with um, a link to my cancer genome so that they can, the provider can actually get more information. Um, I think that's really important because 
you know, your clinical report is valid for the moment that you make it, right? But an oncologist and might make their decision about what to do with that patient that day. But six months down the road, when that patient has progressed and they need to make a new therapeutic decision, they'd like to be able to come back to this resource and evaluate if there's any new information that's come since that time. And so this really provides a way to do that. I will also say that, as, you, as I showed you before, my cancer genome does not have all the content on every single variant that's out there. And so the framework that genome oncology has created enables individual institutions to actually curate their own information so that they can keep it locally. Or if they don't like what we have on my cancer genome, you take it and modify it so that it's your own. So what are some of the challenges and future directions for my cancer genome? Well, one of the things is we're, we're listening. These 56 genes are, are important. They're therapeutically relevant to treatments that are available today for cancer patients. But there are a lot of other genes that people are looking at, and the oncologists are really overwhelmed with what to do with this information. So we did an analysis of 12 next-gen sequencing panels. And we compared all of them. We did the intersection, and we counted how many of the genes listed, and there were 810 different genes across these 12 different panels. How many of them are only in one panel versus in all 12 panels? And we looked at which ones are in my cancer genome. So my cancer genome covers the most common um, genes that are often there. But if you look at this, this panel of information, a lot of these panels, they're, they're private genes that on, are on only one panel or two panels, two-thirds of this list. Um, is really in an investigational stage still. And, and that's not inappropriate. It's just it is the, right, the way it is right now. So we looked at our genes, and, and most of our genes are predictive. And we started to look at the ones in red that were in the far right. And most of those fall into the prognostic pathway you know, for sarcomas and leukemias and other uh, liquid tumors. So some of our strategies right now are to really start increasing our content in the hematologic malignancies um, at, with respect to these prognostic biomarkers in particular. But I want to be tempered with that. Some of our other strategies are to leverage these publicly available resources as we've done already. But you really have to be careful about just blindly bringing in publicly available resources, even our own. Um, and you need to have a refined use of those resources because um, you know, one of the things we pride ourselves on in my cancer genome is the fact that we've actually had experts in the field review the information and they're able to better evaluate what's really important and which might be a distractor. Um, and so we do want to keep that, that policy going. We're also looking at concepts related to crowdsourcing and, and data-driven approaches that we'll talk about in a sec. So from a crowdsourcing perspective, how can we grow our contributor network? So we're, we're trying to be very creative in this. And um, you know, space, groups like Facebook and Google, they've, they've managed to figure a lot of this out. Um, and so we'd like to learn from those um, interesting social networking experiences to see if we can figure out how to find the right carrot to uh, entice broader communities to want to come in and learn and curate at the same time. And not just clinicians, but also um, others. And I tell you, the patient net, um, network has a large place in this, too. But one of the biggest challenges that we have right now in this space is that our populations are getting vanishingly small. You know, that initial study I showed you back in 2002 comparing those four platinum agents in non-small cell lung cancer, that trial had 1,200 patients in it. That was a really good powered study to be able to find a difference, and we didn't find a difference. When we're talking about these populations, even in EGFR with 20%, but now with the resistant mutations, our populations are getting very, very small. And, and it's making people a little uncomfortable because we've gone from having randomized controlled studies of several hundred patients to now potentially making clinical decisions based on case reports. And maybe those are the right clinical decisions, but we really, um, this is a very challenging time with great opportunity to do precision medicine. But some diseases, like ALK mutant lung cancer, is now considered an orphan disease. Do you ever think that lung cancer would become an orphan lung cancer? Well, it's getting said by Cal. So we can't, we can't do this anymore. We can't continue just to learn from the 5% of patients 
to participate in clinical trials. We're not going to learn fast enough. And each of our own institutions may have one of these patients with a rare variant once a year. We need to be able to learn from everybody. And people are talking about these concepts of learning to answer systems and opportunities for data aggregation of cases. And unfortunately, it's not just enough to aggregate information on what variants they had. That's a great start. But we really have to be able to include the clinical outcomes as well. We need information on the treatment, how they did, and their overall survival. And so the concept of a learning cancer system is one where the care of the patient I'm seeing today in clinic is going to be informed by the care of the patients that came before them. And the care of the patient today is going to inform the care of the patient tomorrow. And so national efforts are really underway, data sharing opportunities. We're really going to have to figure out as a culture um, how we're going to break down these barriers of data sharing so that we can all learn from our collective experiences. And that's a really difficult um, challenge for us to overcome as a culture. We all like our private little databases because that's our, our intellectual goal, right? Um, and, and so until we can get past that and learn that we can share and, and, and that the sum is greater than the part, um, I think we're going to see a tide change. So some of the ways we've been, in, um, we've been doing this with respect to the rarer variant um, have been to create that direct database I was talking about. So this is a schematic of the EGFR gene you're all familiar with. Um, the se known sensitizing mutations are up on the top. The known resistance mutations are, up on, are down on the bottom. But these rarer variants um, have really unknown significance with respect to EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And so we created the direct database, um, which has over 1,000 patients um, from the literature, case reports from the literature, um, with non-small cell lung cancer, where in the literature they recorded which EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor they had and what their response was to that therapy. So now, even though my cancer genome only has, what, 10 or 12 of the most prevalent um, EGFR mutations, we're now being able to say for over 180 different EGFR variants, Maybe there's only three case reports in all of the literature, but maybe that information is better than not having anything at all. Some of the other things we've been doing at our own institution have been to take our own data from our um, snapshot experience and now from our NGS experience and start to even just understand the frequency of these alterations in our own population. Um, we have a collaboration um, between, a data sharing collaboration between Vanderbilt and Stanford for our melanoma patients um, where we've included the survival information and what therapies those patients received. These are all just our advanced disease patients uh, creating a, a dashboard to be able to explore the information based on the presence or absence of a particular biomarker, which drugs the patients received, or um, aggregating it by drug class and beginning to be able to see these separations in outcomes for this patient population. So this is just the beginning of our understanding of how to use a data-driven approach um, and we're looking to get further into it. So what I want to end on is, is, is an important um, transition. The creation of an interpretive report for um, any type of uh, biomarker is an important first step. But it isn't the only piece of information that oncologists use in order to make a clinical decision. And so we need to move beyond just reporting the results to also helping them understand which tests to order um, and how, to be honest, how really to select a treatment that is integrated into their computerized data entry systems. So we have a lot of work ahead of us in order to meet this vision of, of, of dealing with the pressures of guideline-driven care versus precision medicine, the current regulatory environment and cost containment environment, um, and really bring together for an oncologist the, the most appropriate information that they need um, in order to help them make a, a treatment decision for an individual patient. So in summary, I, I know you all know that the genomic uh, profiling in cancer is on the rise and it's here to stay. We'll have to see what um, some of the reimbursement issues are as we move forward. Those are very exciting conversations and heated. Um, 
My Cancer Genome is a knowledge base that provides decision support for the clinical utility of alterations in cancer. And I've shown you some of the strategies we're using to generate our content as well as disseminating it, um, as well as some glimpses of future strategies for clinical decision support that we hope will become useful for oncologists, as well as for those doing the interpretation at the bench. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge all of our um, collaborators in this, and this list uh, can go on for several pages, um, as well as our grant support and, and, of course, our industry partner that's really helping us to bring my cancer genome out into a clinical workflow that um, we couldn't have done by ourselves. I thank you for your time, and just a reminder that there are drinks in the back, and we'll take your questions at any time. Thank you. Melanoma. Melanoma. Okay. Um, we don't have anything. And if you have an EGFR receptor mutation, perhaps it can extend life uh, six months more. So most of the mutation characterized is not based upon the genetic content. Genetic content. And also, as you really pointed out, many of the cases, three variant, you are find out three patients based upon the fact that neoplastic cells have a variant and normal doesn't have, that will not qualify that it is really actionable or it is really cause of that. So all the precision medicine so far put forward is really minimal at this stage, except a poster child, two or three. You have mentioned in the first part of the lecture, I think perhaps more progress we can make in the immunotherapy based upon PDL1, PDL2, et cetera, which is based upon not on mutation, is based upon cancer phenotype. Perhaps that may be the one generally any cancer, leukemia, lymphoma, any one of them can be used. These type of biomarker mutations perhaps can have minimal effect in the future cancer gene. Tell me what the question is. The question is that we are just uh, saying, it emphasizes the fact that the clinical utility of the most of the things we are talking is minimal. Even lung cancer, we are talking a large about EGF receptor mutation. Uh, for 85, two or three mutation variant, but that comprises only 10% of them, and it is having extent of life for a few months. So um, you're absolutely right. I think that in um, 2009, 2010, when we were first seeing the RAS miraculous response in melanoma, as, as I work with a lot of melanoma doctors, they, they had never seen responses like that ever in the treatment of melanoma. So there are some really miraculous responses, but they're not durative. They don't last very long. And that has been an incredible frustration in this field. And I think that the next step is how to figure out how to help make those responses more durative. Um, and, and, and probably it is the combination of these targeted therapeutics with something like immunotherapy or checkpoint inhibitors. Um, the number of drugs in the clinical trial pipeline right now is staggering, and it's a wonderful opportunity. You know, oncologists, I think, have a lot more comfort um, with choosing therapies that might work, because otherwise the, the 
the alternative is, is death. And so as opposed to other areas of medicine, I think that um, we are looking for those things that can help guide our treatment selection because the, the historical opportunities that we had for patients were grim in many diseases. So I, I agree with you. I think your, your, your tempering of our enthusiasm is, appro is appropriate based on what we've seen in the last four years. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to continue moving forward. Um, and, and as a practicing oncologist, my, my perspective is I really am looking for, and even for those um, immunotherapies, they're looking for biomarkers that are going to pr predict which patients are most likely to benefit, and I still think that's appropriate. They might not be genomic. They might be alternative um, microenvironment um, biomarkers, but we, we, shall, we shall definitely see where that goes. Um, yeah, that was a phenomenal tour de force of a presentation. Um, great job. So as you get into broader forces of content that you're pulling together, the collaborators and eventually the task force and the MNA, um, how do you deal with disagreement? I'll repeat it. So the, the question were, how do you deal with disagreement? Um, and I think that that is, um, you know, there have been a lot of discussions over, you know, who should be maintaining resources like this, right? And so we've done our very best to, um, continue with our, our contributor network to, and we usually have more than one contributor on, on a section um, that, that try to move that content forward. And I think the major disagreements that we have are, is this data mature enough for us to be including, right? Because it's often in that preclinical space or in right, right under the, of the guise of clinical validity, but not yet at the point of clinical utility. And that's really where we start to have most of our discussions about it. But because we're not a guideline, we are willing to put in that information that might be. But when we have conflicting evidence, such as one shows sensitivity and the other one shows resistance, I think we're still having a difficult time arbitrating between those. Um, and all we can do right now is present both um, should, they, should they exist. Um, although I do like the, the concept of, um, you know, the voting strategy that they have in social n networking, you know, 100 people agree and one disagree. You know, maybe the crowd is right. So we'll, we'll see where, that, where, where that's going to go. Maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Or maybe, or maybe not. It's actually true. So we have licensed the content to My Cancer Genome. We did not have the resources to, um, to deal with each of those requests. I'm telling you, in the years prior to us doing that, it was pretty overwhelming for us as an academic institution. So we've licensed our content to Genome Oncology so that they can deal with all of those requests through, through APIs and other, not only through their tool, but through other mechanisms. Um, and so um, those types of arrangements can be directed to them. really interesting, and it's, I like the uh, where we're going with this, but I was wondering, has the F since patients can access your site, has the FDA um, had any questions or concerns about this, or like any regulatory issues? No. Okay. Um, and uh, well, thank you for asking, actually, the FDA. We've talked to them several times. They, have, they love the resource. Um, and I, I think that uh, there's been a lot of debate in the informatics world as to whether um, decision support tools should be regulated. Today they are not, unlike this whole discussion about lab-directed testing. That seems to be the next big thing that the FDA wants to tackle, so we'll see if they, if they want to get us into the device manufacturing industry. But, um, you know, sort of speaking back to patients for just a moment, um, one of the things we've been absolutely flabbergasted by are patients who come in with reams of my cancer genome content printed out at the time of their appointment. And unfortunately, they don't, they don't always have the right pages printed out. <laughs> so, um, you know, this really does um, show that it's, it's being used, but, but maybe it's not completely understood. I didn't put it in here, but we, do, we did just get a grant um, um, from the um, Medical Library Association um, to look at how we can create this content for patients. Um, because we, we did do some initial analysis and we were told by our knowledge experts um, um, that we would have to create the content at a sixth grade reading level. And so you can't even say the word gene when you have a sixth grade reading level. So that was very difficult. So the tools that we're developing right now for patients that we're evaluating in the melanoma space 
are really trying to take into account both the literacy level of the patient as well as their learning styles. So not everyone likes to learn in the same way. Some people retain information better when it's presented um, uh, from an auditory perspective, some from a visual perspective, some when they read it. So we're experimenting both for patients and for providers on what's the best way to optimally um, present information so that they can learn. All right, with that, um, thank you so much for your attention and please enjoy a drink and some food.